Welcome to Mulready Minutes with Oklahoma Insurance Commissioner Glenn Mulready. This is a podcast about insurance for insurance folks, risk managers, and business leaders. We'll dive deep and look at what is and isn't working, talk to leaders in the industry, and keep you informed on what's happening in Oklahoma and around the country. Well, welcome back to the second edition of our conversation with uh, Paul Martin on disaster preparedness. Paul's an attorney and an author and insurance guy and overall good guy, but uh, we're, we're going to continue this conversation in episode two. So a couple other things, Paul. You train and provide something called the Rapid Preparedness System, um, that, focusing on three things. Do you want to talk about that? Sure. For a second? Uh, and so in this, the manual I've created, I, I have focused on getting as prepared as you can, as quickly as you can, and as inexpensively as you can, because those seem to be the barriers. How long is it going to take me to get prepared? And how much is it going to cost? The cost thing is, is a big variable because I don't know your situation. If it's cheaper for two people to prepare than it is for eight, right? So we look for ways to reduce those costs. And that is why I have really focused my efforts on encouraging people when you are buying things to stock up on the food, the water, the medications, get that at your local grocery store. Uh, most of the shelf stable stuff that you see at your grocery store that will work just fine for your needs. It's stuff you're already eating right now. Um, and I, I think that's the, the real driver here is that the easier we can make this and the less expensive we can make the process of preparedness, the more likely people are actually to engage in it. Good. That's helpful. And then you, um, in your action plan, you talk about seven, is it seven categories? Seven categories. Yeah. So can you talk about those? Sure. So in, in, in the manual we go through and I tell people to do one thing at a time. And I say, we're going to start with food and you're going to pick how long of a period you want to be prepared for two months, two weeks, you know, half a year, whatever you set that parameter. Once you've done that, we're going to get the food that you need and we're only going to focus on food. So we start with food first. And once we're done with food, then we're going to move to the next step and that's water. How much water do you need for that period of time? How are you going to purify that water? How are you going to collect more water when that runs out? We talk about that. The third thing is cash. And when I say cash, I mean not cash in the bank, but actually cash in your hand, cash somewhere in your house, because what if the power goes out and your ATM isn't working? What if the local grocery stores no longer can use, uh, take debit or credit cards because of some crash to the system that, that processes those? You need cash, physical cash in your home that you can access outside of a bank so that you can pay those basic bills. Then we move on to hygiene and sanitation, which I think are probably the most overlooked items. Uh, what hurts people in disasters generally isn't the disaster. You know, you talked about uh, the folks who were, uh, experienced a tornado. I suspect people were unfortunately injured running chainsaws, running power tools, working at weird hours in the night in the dark trying to clean up the mess. We see lots of those type of injuries. We see lots of illnesses after a large-scale disaster because of sanitation issues. Uh, from there, we look, move to energy and lighting. How are you going to turn on the lights in your house? Do you have a backup system? Do you have lanterns, battery-powered lanterns? Um, and then we look at uh, you know communication. What is your plan to communicate with your family locally? What is the plan to communicate with your neighbors? Uh, and then security, last and foremost, because what happens, what we see is in times of disaster, Response times for police, fire, EMS go up dramatically. You know, fewer people coming to work because some of those people have been affected by the disaster directly. There's more res things for them to go do if the city is not working, if, if traffic lights are out and everyone's calling 911 for help. Be ready to be your own first responder and have some plans to make your house more secure in times of disaster. So we go through those seven things and we do those seven things in order and the idea is that once you conclude one topic and you move to the next you're going to start feeling more prepared and hopefully your stress level will go down as well yeah that was a, a memorable part in the book too it's about being prepared to be your own first responder and so along those lines I, some basic things you can do is a, is a cpr course with the red cross or a first aid course as sort of some some, right. some starting points there so paul as, as we kind of prepare to close out we're in Oklahoma. We're, we're with the Oklahoma Insurance Department. Any unique challenges or situations you think of uh, from being a, a prepared um, status uh, that, are, that might not apply elsewhere? Or yeah. I mean, so every state thinks they're the best, right? Um, in Oklahoma, though, in all seriousness, when I think of this state, I think of three critical roles it plays to the well-being of this country. Its role in the ag sector, 
its role in the energy sector, and its role in the transportation sector. America Insurance was just outside of insurance, that. Insurance, right? it, it was a close fourth, <laughs> Commissioner. Uh, but insurance makes all those things work. But I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. We need Oklahoma to be, and Oklahomans to be able to function. All of us do as Americans. And so the more that Oklahoma is prepared, the stronger our nation is prepared because of the vital role the state plays. Now, talking about insurance, one of the things I stress to people is part of your preparedness plan needs to be insurance. You need to be visiting with your agent once a year for that insurance checkup, and no one wants to do that. Well, that's boring, and that's going to cost me money. I've never had a situation where going to my insurance agent once a year was a bad thing. Most of the time, every year, he found a way to save me money. And making sure I have the right coverages, making sure I'm not overpaying mm -hmm. for coverages, because that financial piece is such a, big, uh, such a big deal. We had some tornadoes in Texas just a week ago, just outside of Austin. And we're finding that a number of those people had no homeowner's insurance whatsoever. And now they're in line to get assistance from the state. They're in line to get assistance from charity and from FEMA. It would have been so much better if those folks had had a way to have insurance. And I don't know what prevented them from getting insurance, but those who have insurance uh, are in such a better place to get their house rebuilt and, and to get rebuilt timely and to get it built back to code mm -hmm. so that they are ready for the next storm. Yeah, I, I talk about that a lot when I'm, I'm out speaking publicly, typically associated with flood and how when we experienced the you know, worst flooding in our history uh, in 2019, how 90% of the damage was uninsured, and uh, which is really flip-flop of what we typically see in a tornado situation or some other scenario. And you know, I think folks believe that FEMA is going to ride in on their white horse and rescue them. And, and indeed, FEMA does come in and they are helpful, but uh, not near to the extent that being fully covered for with insurance coverage would be. I mean, there, there's assistance there, but it doesn't take care of the damage uh, that has, has, been, has happened there. Some of the numbers I've seen from Hurricane Harvey, the delta between those who had flood coverage through FEMA, NFIP, and those who just got FEMA assistance uh, is, you know, 90 to 100,000 if you had flood and maybe as low as 1500 if you didn't have flood insurance yeah. it's a huge delta so the extent that people can have insurance including flood insurance uh it will improve your life dramatically at the time of, of the storm so paul we're moving into our storm season which is really how we kind of launched or why we've launched mulready says get ready before during and after a storm so in your household and when you know when you're coming into storm season and uh, you're getting a forecast of a storm what other other extra things that you do that maybe aren't happening when there isn't a storm warning in, in play. Right. So in our family, we have what I call the preparedness binder, and it has a series of tabs so that, talking about your story earlier, um, if I'm not at home, any member of my family can get the preparedness binder, flip to the chapter that we're doing in the next five, six hours, and read the checklist of things we need to do before, during, and after. So those tabs are by uh, by what type of category? They're, they're by what we would call in the insurance business perils, right? Okay. Severe storm, wildfire, um, power outage, Got it. those sorts of things, hurricane, tropical storm, so that we, uh, we know. And if I sense that we're going to have a period where a tropical storm, something we know has got a long, I've, I've got a long lead time on. Uh, I have what I call my A checks, B checks, C checks, and I'll start working through those. Now, I don't expect most people to do that because, I mean, I'm, I'm a little different. I'm, <laughs> you know, a little more uptight when it comes to this sort of thing. But I think a family in Oklahoma who they're under a severe uh, thunderstorm watch or a tornado watch, that should trigger a few things, right? First of all, they need to know where are we? Where is the family in the next six hours or through the, the, the duration of the warning or the watch? Uh, are we at ball games? Are we at church? Are we at school or is it the weekend? Is a kid over at someone else's house? We need to have an accountability system where we know where everyone's going to be that, and, and, and be, have a way to get in touch with them if things get bad. If they're going to uh, an activity, a youth activity, is there some adult there who's going to be paying attention to the weather? Mm -hmm. You may have to become that adult. That's the sort of thing because not everyone's going to be thinking in these terms all the time. So that's the first thing is to figure out where everyone is. And then if things get bad, if the winds get up and we need to take shelter, what do you want the family to do? Where do you want them to go? Rehearse that. When my kid was, uh, you know, her seven or eight, we started doing disaster drills at our house. And she wasn't really keen on it, so I created this system called Disaster Dollars. And for every drill she did successfully, she got cash 
uh, and that was something of a motivator. And then the American Girl catalog came to the house. <laughs> And she and her friend had been sitting and looking at one day, and she came home, and she and with the fire drill that I wanted her to do was we have one of those rope fire ladders that you can buy at, you know, some of the you know Home Depot or whatever. And she her bedroom was on the second floor, and I wanted her to be able to deploy that ladder, get out the window, get on the ground by herself with no adult supervision. And she came home one and, and to complete the drill, she got ten dollars every time she did the drill. She says, we're doing that drill today for five times because I need $50. <laughs> so we got her to That's the point great. where she could get from her bed, out the window, get the ladder deployed, get on the ground in under 90 seconds. So I paid her $50. Now, she thought she was ripping me off, but who wouldn't pay 50 bucks to know that in an emergency, my kid has the skill and the, and the know-how and the resources to get out the window and that on the age. ground in 90 seconds? And, and, you know, she was like eight years old. Mm -hmm at the time so do those drills um, and then start playing what if what if mom and dad aren't home when tornado comes or when weather comes at what point do kids feel like they should get into the shelter without being prompted to do so uh, what happens if mom and dad are home and the power goes out what should the kids do is there a survival box a, a preparedness box of flashlights and supplies and glow sticks or whatever it is you want to put in there so that kids can navigate around the house if they're by themselves start thinking in those terms um, and again beginning of storm season have that conversation with your insurance agent one of the things i recommend people do is is to say okay let's say a tornado uh, takes off my roof show me the math of what i get if they tell me it cost fifty thousand dollars to replace my roof how much am I going to pay out of pocket? How much is my insurance company going to pay? Because a lot of people think they understand how their deductible works, mm -hmm. and then they have a claim, and maybe they don't have replacement costs. Maybe they have uh, an ACV policy on their roof. Uh, how is that going to work? How, I, I need to know. And, and you may find that, you know, gee whiz, with supply chain issues, with labor shortages, uh, with demand surge, you may find that you don't have enough insurance on your home. You may need to increase it depending on your policy yeah. uh, to and make I'll, sure you have If coverage. I can interrupt, Paul, yeah, inject right now just from the insurance department standpoint, something that I think I find as I'm out um, interacting and speaking publicly is I think a lot of folks aren't aware that most every homeowner's policy now has moved to a, a percentage for wind and hail deductible separate from it wasn't all that long ago. You had a $500 deductible on your homeowner's. Right. You had a $1,000 deductible, and that was across the board. But at least here in Oklahoma, most all homeowners have moved to a, a 1%, a 2% deductible, and, you know, that, that can be a substantial amount that, uh, it, as you just described, the roof blows off, that's going to be a substantial deductible versus the old days. So and a lot of that. people, when they get that percentage deductible, think that percentage is a percentage of the claim and not a percentage of what their home is insured for. Mm -hmm. And that's a very sobering conversation to have post-disaster. So one of the things I recommend is sit down with your agent and have an exercise go through what it would look what like ifs. if right what ifs what if my if my outbuilding if my shed out back gets you know gets clobbered do you pay for that if so how much and does that is, does a deductible apply um if it is it matter how it's destroyed if it's destroyed by fire does that affect how much it pays versus wind or hail those are the sorts of questions you need to ask so that you understand and you can see if there's any shortages, any uh, shortcomings in your plans, your financial plans, so that you can make changes to that as well. So once we've done those things, you know, we, we've figured out where everyone is during the, the tornado watch or, or, or severe thunderstorm watch. Um, we've, we've drilled this a few times. We've, we've got insurance. At this point, we just need to be vigilant and pay attention, right? And don't do things like, gee whiz, I know there's a thunderstorm over there, um, but maybe it's okay if I go to the grocery store, right? Maybe it is, maybe it's not, but you've got to have a heightened sense of awareness of what's going on around you so that you're not caught inadvertently out in severe weather. Yeah. So in talking about that, too, I, I just think about um, trying to make our homes more resilient and, uh, and sort of mitigating some of the risks. Um, you know, some of that is building materials. Some of that is action you can take as far as things around your home. But talk about some of the things that folks can do, maybe with some things you've done at, at your home from a resiliency and, and a mitigation standpoint. Right. So if anyone is building a home from scratch, I highly recommend that they go to the 
uh, Institute for Insurance, Business, and Home Safety, IBHS. You go to that website and you download uh, what's called the Fortify Program Guidelines. And that is how to build your house to make it more resistant to wind, hail. Uh, there are programs to make it more resistant to hurricanes, uh, wildfires now. They're doing work on that area as well. We built our home a few years ago and we actually built it to high wind and hail standards. Doesn't really cost that much more to do that, but you get a lot more protection. If you're if you're not building your house, you know some of the things you want to look at is um, you know, we'll start with just the basics. Uh, do you, are your door is your alarm system monitored? Do you have an alarm system and is it monitored? Uh, a lot of people have alarm systems, I find, but then they don't pay for monitoring. What kind of doors do you have and, and, and are the door locks sufficient? Uh, look at um, if if you're concerned about flying debris in a storm. You know uh, they make this film that you can put on your windows that you can't notice the film but it greatly increases security of that window from being smashed by debris or someone tries to break in. Um, generators. Should you have a generator? I get this question a lot. Um, that's a it's a good question and it really is, is dependent on a number of things because for the generator run you have to have fuel and do you really want to store lots and lots of gasoline to run that generator? Uh, maybe you're in a place where you can do that. Um, and if you're going to run the generator, do you have a sense for what you're going to run with it? Because you see these ads where the small generator runs all the electronics and all the lights in the house. That's not realistic, as mm -hmm. you know. Um, have a plan to run the freezers and the refrigerators and charge up your devices, uh, those sorts of things. Um, and then beyond that, you know, it's, it's not really, uh, uh, there's no rocket science to this. Um, you could go to ready.gov. That's the FEMA's website. They've got a lot of great ideas of, of things you can do in terms of having a first aid kit and having uh, flashlights. Um, my kid complained last year, and she's, she's a young adult, and she complained that I asked her for a flashlight. We were over his place. She says, I don't have one. And it's one of those things as a prepper dad, <laughs> yeah. you just feel like you Wrong just failed. For this dad. <laughs> well, you feel like you failed as a prepper dad. Like, how do you not have a flashlight? And so I went on Amazon, and her Christmas stocking had like 15 LED flashlights. I just shoved them all in there. <laughs> and uh, I'm like, you will never say that to me again. You have no excuse now. Um, and making sure you, you do those things, those little basic things. You know, have flashlights in your vehicle. Uh, have a fire extinguisher in your vehicle. Um, teach your kids how to change a tire. Uh, that's, that's the, that was a battle we had at my house because I wanted to teach the teenager when she got her first car on how to change the tire. And she's like, I can just go on YouTube and watch it watch a video or I can just call AAA. I'm like, well that's true, but it would be nice for you to like know some life skills and how to, how to do some things. So, um, and, I, and on my on my blog how much I did that lesson cost you. Uh, I I never could. I mean, I I could have put a pretty significant dollar figure and I don't know that I could have gotten her to the point where I, I was probably not willing to pay what it would have taken to get <laughs> her to good. learn how to do that. Good. Well, you, you've mentioned a, a, a couple sites, and I just want to repeat those for, for yeah. folks. But uh, IBHS is one, which is right. a great resource. Uh, I know they, they, they'll walk through the resiliency and, and construction and even – you know, I'll tell you, they'll coach you through having bushes and trees close to your house and how much of a difference that makes, the proximity to your to your home. Uh, but then also um, uh, FEMA's site, which is ready.gov, which right. has a lot of good material. And then also uh, our, our site uh, has some things too, so oid.ok.gov. So there's three sites that folks could visit to learn more, uh, pick up on this That's uh, right. issue. So. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Mulready Minutes. That wraps up our conversation with Paul Martin. You have some great resources to go to with those websites, uh, ready.gov, the IBHS website, and of course, always, oid.ok.gov. Thanks for joining us.